Next, may I invite Ms. Sohi Hamad to present in the topic of engaging researchers in the art of research integrity, introduction to the responsible conduct of research. Please welcome Ms. Hamad. Thank you very much for exemplifying the first principle mentioned by Dr. Ruth Bong, which is science with humanity, as Gandhi mentioned. First of all, your kindness in speaking English for me, I appreciate very much that if it were not for my presence, you would probably be speaking in Thai. So thank you very much for your humility. I also would like to acknowledge Dr. Kasif for his serving as an exemplar in this entire field of research integrity because of his progression and pioneering spirit in recognizing this is not something we should wait until we have a huge Thai case that hits the national and international media. In fact, Dr. Prasit is hosting this forum along with your other two co-sponsors as an example of coming together for a conversation prior to prior to the point where you have a huge problem which you need to handle and quickly panic and figure out how to put systems in place, which is, as we all know, not the best approach. So I was very fortunate to be born in Edinburgh, in Scotland, and grew up in Hawaii, the other side of the world. And in both places, as you have in Thailand, there are beautiful clouds and rainbows. So this is just a rainbow, I'm not plagiarizing, this is my own photograph that I took on my beach in Hawaii. And I like to imagine this arc of research integrity. As Professor Yuthabong mentioned, everyone in the research enterprise is accountable. Not just, oh, the researchers need to do this, the journals need to do that, the funding agencies must do this. All of us need to take our individual role and contribute each day, not just when we come to a conference or as we have some people in, in America, for example, they're quite well behaved when they go to church on Sunday, but then the rest of the week they're not as um, providing as good examples of what those principles entail. So I like to see this as an accountable research community or ARC. And we know that this means that administrators at all levels, whether they are the head of the funding agency, the president, vice president of the largest university, or even the department chairs and deans, down to the faculty supervisors, and even those postdocs who, now that they are lower on the food chain, can turn around and abuse their students and their research assistants. No, each of us needs to take our role with responsibility and that those administrators and senior leaders take action when appropriate and are attentive to all. So, for example, if you have a case of misconduct, it's not that this individual who is accused happens to be one of your prime star researchers like Juan Musuk, who brings in a lot of money for research to the university. Oh, let's not touch that one because he's good for us, national profile, etc. Instead, treating everyone consistently is fundamental. And being attentive to people's concerns. When I was conducting the role of the research integrity officer at the University of Hawaii, for example, as Dr. Prasit mentioned, there is this spectrum of behaviors that come across the desk of the research integrity officer. And only a small percentage were falsification, fabrication, or plagiarism. Most of them were conflicts of interest academic divorce, authorship, we used to be in love, but now we despise each other, I want my data back, I want my name off your paper, etc., etc., and often, unfortunately, sexual harassment cases that occurred in the research or academic environment in general. So very often the role in the U.S. sometimes is of triage or sending the individual, offering them a supportive, safe place where they can um, bring their concerns and a safe haven and some tissue as they express their concerns, and then directing them to the Dean of Graduate Affairs or whichever office may handle their concern if it does not fall under the purview of that research integrity officer. So 
Similarly, researchers must be responsible, as we've learned, and serve as role models. We learn everything, whether you're a scientist, a lawyer, engineer, astronomer, you learn from those who go before you. We learn from our parents, we learn from our friends, our older siblings, if you will, in the family of research or academia. And if they play by the rules, if you will, we will tend to do the same. We will follow their example. Sometimes, as you mentioned, Dr. Mithavon, they are not necessarily written rules, but codes of conduct that may not be recorded, but actually part of the academic discipline in which you work. And we have the community that comes together, not only your dean, your department, but also within the university itself, and in broader contexts, for example, when you are collaborating with individuals around the world, or even just in Thailand or with Malaysia. This community must create a culture of integrity together, and, as Gandhi said, behave with compassion and kindness as we follow our curious dreams. I have the permission of my young nephew, and Lise Easton and Amaya Hammett, to use their pictures. These are a couple of years old, so now they are actually of the age, sort of, to consent. They are seven and nine now. <laughs> so to demonstrate some of these examples, and as we know, the pursuit of knowledge is what brings us all here. I am not only learning from everyone with whom I communicate. We are all learning from our environment. And so, curiosity is what drives us. We want to unravel the mysteries of the universe and understand what is inside. How does this work? How can we make it of benefit, whether for human health, for our, our uh, engaging in our universe around us? However, as we are faced with our many options and directions, in particularly pursuing an academic career, it obviously can become daunting, and the burdens you mentioned weigh upon us heavy as we are beginning to embark on a new academic or scientific career, in any discipline, in fact. You mentioned from the Young Scientist Network in Malaysia that there are these pressures to publish, and smaller amount of faculty positions available, all of the prestigious rewards that we think we will achieve if we are able to make the highest marks and have the highest number of publications, etc., etc. So an obvious solution may be education. And in this field, because as we've seen from mention of some of the very high profile cases, particularly in the US in the early stages of research integrity and responsible conduct of research as a discipline, it is a reactive field. It is not one that was built around hypotheses and testing questions such as Galileo did, how far away are the stars? Let's design a telescope and see. It's one that was based upon the public cry for a demand in trust in science. We know there are these big cases. Al Gore, for example, held congressional hearings in the United States and said we need to know that the research being funded by our government, in other words, our taxpayers' dollars, is in fact trustworthy. So this means a lot of the research Responsible conduct of research disciplines, if you will, there were initially meant several areas that were designated as uh, required for training, are things that seem to be important. However, it's not all encompassing. And as we know, this concept of mentoring is particularly important in infusing those principles that may be taught in a lecture. And very often, as I'm sure you've all experienced, you are very busy doing your work and you are required to go to a course, you're listening now often on people's cell phones, they're not really paying attention, and it's just one more tick in a box of many things to do. So one of the most important topics we heard about uh, mentioned this morning is data management. And again, we know since history has a long and illustrious spectrum of various kinds of data. One example, we know we can learn from the Italians as well, 
is Leonardo da Vinci, who in the 1500s, this is 1508, was recording his observations of nature and had his own special way of observing how things worked. This is particularly looking at concave mirrors and the reflection of light. And he was curious about producing intensity and heat and thought perhaps this could um, give rise to some invention. So interestingly, he was worried about scrutiny from the Catholic Church, and so he wrote backwards in a way that he thought he could code his language. This is the sort of thing that sometimes, if you're not keeping your lab notebook properly, if people can't understand it and be able to reuse and re replicate it, you may have this similar confusion and also with language barriers. Now, these notebooks are available online by uh, the graciousness of the British Library. They were collected. Leonardo kept them actually as uh, loose bundles when he walked around in nature. They are now bound, actually, um, several hundred years ago. They became bound and are now available online because of these advances in science and technology. And, of course, you have electronic notebooks. There are pros and cons to both of them. But, as we heard from uh, our speaker this morning, there are greater potential sometimes for being able to manipulate that data. You can't go back and erase uh, sepia ink and calligraphy. If you are working with an electronic notebook, it can become quite easy to manipulate images and be even lazy about it and not even flip the uh, direction. So it's a perpetual question that this child at a science fair is asking, how should we record the data? This is in particularly the scientific field. We know there must be visual depictions, some kind of pondering. And as uh, Professor Danny Chan in Hong Kong mentioned a couple of days ago, it's not about proving our hypothesis, but testing it. And if it's wrong, well then good, we've learned something and publishing those negative data. And obviously being accurate in demonstrating your results. This can become even more complicated when we are looking at translational, interdisciplinary, collaborative research involving lots of different disciplines. For example, in medicine, you may collaborate with engineers and oh la la, they have different ways of recording their data. How do we make sure we're coming to agreement about our being able to attest to the veracity and validity of the data. This image is from uh, Vani et al. in Plus One, and it's not related to research integrity. It's about social networks and looking at HIV and HPV um, research collaboration around the world. But I use it as an example for research integrity because of the fact that we can see most of the dominant countries who are providing the most amounts of money, the USA, Netherlands, France, Sweden, Belgium, are also those who are primarily pushing the field forward as far as the regulatory framework. These other countries are involved in the research and have come up with their own regimes and it's a little bit slower, partly because the amount of funding going toward the research is, is greater and historically uh, we had cases in the United States and elsewhere, now we have them popping up in other parts of the world. And as I said, Dr. Prasit is quite um, thoughtful in having these conversations before that happens. So we know that data has a life cycle, as we all do. And for those of you who are conducting research, this is familiar, there are whole um, aspects related to each of these to which I cannot speak because I'm not a scientist, I'm a lawyer, but I can understand some of the regulatory framework that occurs around each of these in looking at the initial conversation about data and recording ideas which can be plagiarized according to the US regulation. Placing your preliminary data and hypotheses into a grant application, for example, recording it in your notebooks, then being able to create a publication and manuscript, analyzing and moving forward as you assess its applicability to other fields, and then being able to demonstrate its integrity 10 years later. This can 
become even more complicated when you have international collaborations. Can you imagine when we have clinical sites, for example, HIV AIDS is a good example. In different parts of the world, we have perhaps some funding coming from all parts and regulatory regimes. But if you imagine the confusion that can occur with data going across borders, not to mention the laws required, but just keeping things intact and identifying risk points and where these places can um, create gaps in research integrity that may become a slippery slope from being good practice to perhaps maybe not so good to perhaps questionable to perhaps misconduct and the scale tips when we lose attention and are not being scrupulous about how we manage our data. Again, after a major case occurred in the news, the Royal Netherlands Academy put together an advisory committee, which came up with a wonderful report. I, I uh, urge you all to read it if you are interested in principles of data management. They surveyed about 79 scientists, academics from various disciplines, and decided, in their wisdom, that they could not come up with one unique standard for all disciplines to say, this is how you should manage your data, because obviously the disciplines vary. What they did acknowledge is these risk points we heard about this morning, several of which are integral. One of the most I'd like to emphasize is the risk of the individual researcher working alone, in isolation. They don't have their peers for coffee to talk about. There isn't enough time to expose the data in journal club or regular meetings with the lab. Their PI is off giving lectures in Hawaii or elsewhere and does not have time to review the raw data. And suddenly it's, up oh, time to submit the grant. I need the data, I need the graph, da, 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 put it in. Oh, I don't have time to review the raw data. Let's just submit. Oh, I'm not so sure I got the data you wanted. It's OK, we'll fix it later. Those are some of the problems you mentioned, the, the time pressures that can contribute to these um, lapses in research integrity, not necessarily motivated by the sort of criminal intent we heard about from some of these glamorous and very handsome people. So the US definition Dr. Prasid mentioned is fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. I want to point your attention, though, to one of the most challenging aspects, which is in addition to this section 104 of our regulation, uh, section 103, the definition, there's also section 104, which describes the evidence and the intent, the mental state for proving the misconduct on behalf of the US government in this context for the Department of Health and Human Services, which primarily relates to National Institutes of Health funding, Centers for Disease Control, and others. And it must be a significant departure from accepted practices. In other words, if this is so egregious that anyone in the field, any subject matter expert would look at this and say, that's not how we do it. This arises, however, from data for the most part. With plagiarism, it's a bit more simple. You don't need to, to rely upon Google, but there are specific software programs whereby plagiarism can be detected. However, in some cases, I had a case in Hawaii, for example, where the researcher was from a country in Asia and had done his dissertation at the University of Hawaii 25 years ago. And he cited long passages from particular individuals' work, verbatim. He then said, uh, author, author et al, and included in the references at the end of his dissertation, there was a political sort of smearing campaign against him, and several allegations came into our university saying this man plagiarized his doctoral thesis 25 years ago. Okay, so I had to go to my library at the University of Hawaii and say, what is the accepted practice at the time, 25 years ago? Well, there was no graduate um, writing your thesis kind of handbook. There was no guidance on how to properly cite and make sure you use quotations, which is the US standard. And we had the 
chance to interview his doctoral thesis chair and a couple of the committee members and ask, did you ever mention to this professor the use of quotation marks, proper citation? And he came in his cane. He was very gracious to come and, and meet with us to clear the name of his former student. He said, no, we never had a conversation about proper citation style. We focused on the substance of the work. Natural. So in the end, we decided because he had uh, not the intent to uh, mislead people about it, he was trying to cite, and there was no conversation about proper citation, that he was not guilty, and we described it as an honest error in that instance. What was most interesting to me was when I went to the library, I said, oh, this is 25 years ago. Maybe they didn't have one, but I asked, do we have one now for his particular discipline? <gasps> there was no guidance given to those students in that discipline, even now. <laughs> so I spoke with our graduate dean, and she was able to then refer students to another one from another department, which was very good. So it's not necessarily an intentional um, movement to make people be dishonest. It's just there are gaps and risk points. There are also tremendous complexities in investigating these cases, some of which you mentioned. Um, I had the honor of working at the Office of Research Integrity in Washington, D.C., and working uh, with Dr. John Dahlberg, who was the former deputy director of that office, and he was there since its inception, basically managed many cases. And he said the greatest percent were those who succumbed to the pressures and, and really were vulnerable to those risks, not necessarily the more like 1% who he called the bad apples, who were just really devious and wanted to deceive. So these complexities include the areas about which you may be familiar, including human subjects, animal subjects, biosafety. It's confusing. I mean, I'm a lawyer. And I tried to make very simple for the researchers coming in who happen to intersect all areas. And they say, which law am I supposed to follow? Human subjects law is different from research integrity law, for example. How am I supposed to ensure that I'm complying? And besides that, I don't have time to worry about compliance. I need to worry about my actual research study. So it is critical to acknowledge that there are some simple ways that the university can help make it easier to uh, behave with integrity, not just compliance. If the university is able to simplify the procedures and provide training that engages in ethical decision-making and deliberation, not just lectures, but having conversations about these gray areas, perhaps not just the very dramatic cases that come to our attention and we all sit here and say, I would never do that. But in the end, some of these things can happen to people who are behaving very honestly and suddenly because of the pressures, they fall victim and probably they haven't had a lot of sleep for several days because they're working hard, taking care of their mother-in-law, their children, etc. So many confounding variables come into play. We also know that in investigating misconduct, very often our panels, many of whom I've had discussions, have said, well, I know what to do. I just act as though I'm in a, a television drama series. And I say, did you or did you not fabricate that graph? Well, it doesn't work that way. Very often there are panels who are reluctant to speak out against their peers. If there is a, a respondent who's quite high profile at the university, they'll sit there and just nod and not really want to ask probing questions. So it's critical for the person in this role who may be conducting an inquiry, maybe not even an investigation, but a conversation around these uh, problems to have equipoise and balance and ensure that the respondent as well as the complainant and the faculty member's rights are respected throughout the process. This is much easier when you have procedures in place and a very simple policy to follow so that everyone on campus knows what is our policy, what happens if I commit misconduct, however defined at your particular institution. And of course, the administration 
is sometimes not as willing to make a finding against that very fancy senior, glamorous, handsome researcher. Oh, because they play golf with them on Saturday, or their wives are friends and they have the same social um, engagements. This kind of thing is critical to consistency. Probably, most importantly, we don't know whether there is much connection between all of these RCR courses we've done in the US for nearly 30 years and prevention of research misconduct. Again, it's not a very um, hypothesis-driven kind of field. So when I was at the Office of Research Integrity, one of my um, aspects of my portfolio was managing the grants program. So instead of looking at only this tenuous link between RCR, or Responsible Conduct of Research, and research misconduct, prevention of misconduct, we wanted to look at some of the support systems and other factors that you mentioned earlier where there are these pressure points within the system and the environment that need to be addressed. For example, Sally Rocky, who was the former director of extramural research at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, she came up with some ideas such as reducing the um, number of uh, publications required on the NIH biosketch and looking at the quality, not just a long list of publications, but how good are they? And in, similarly, at your university, what kinds of service, what kind of exemplar is this person providing? Not just their various grants and manuscripts, but are they serving as a model for us? Can we emphasize them in a research integrity network newsletter, some kind of incentive to encourage them to behave. In this part of the world, we have seen recent cases. We heard one about one of them this morning, uh, including Japan and Taiwan, who just recently have established national offices. I had the honor of speaking with uh, Dr. Naoko Akimoto, for example, in Japan. They came to um, visit us in Washington and invited us to have the first ever symposium on research integrity in Japan after the unfortunate Riken scandal. And the new director of Riken was present and he described a very intriguing approach to the data management for Riken, which was someone at a very high level within the institute would check every single thing before the data was released from the institution. So perhaps not possible for all of those deans or vice deans or uh, presidents who are extremely busy, but making people aware that those are some of the tools at your availability. For example, in your Office of Research Development, you might have someone who does a little random cross-check with some of the grant applications or manuscripts that are released. And Taiwan, similarly, reactive, had a big case. And suddenly, they now have an Office of Research Integrity at the national level and are also doing wonderful things to promote in integrity education. France, similarly, established an office after a very high-profile case and is taking a more gentle approach. Each of these offices I've mentioned is guideline, not national regulation yet but guidelines, and particularly in France, recognizing the Académie Française and making sure that people at the university level don't feel the government is imposing rules upon them uh, and hindering their scientific exploration. So we know that in the US, it becomes public when a researcher is found guilty of research misconduct. And the grants, manuscripts, etc., their name, their university is all listed in Japan, in contrast. They decided not to name the individual researcher, but to acknowledge the university where the misconduct occurred. And instead of saying black mark negative against this university, it's a sign of pride that they are taking responsibility and being accountable for the research. So they are rewarding uh, through recognition, not uh, 500,000 baht, uh, but rewarding that university for taking a stand and assessing and evaluating problems that occur. This is my office, formerly, at the University of Hawaii, where, as I mentioned, I tried to create a 
safe haven for people to come with concerns. This is one example of where RCR education can be quite helpful. And Liz Wager and Anna Marusik uh, from uh, UK and Croatia, respectively, recently produced an article in the Cochrane Library 2016 where they looked at um, some of the research on research integrity and found that they were either, for the most part, small sample size or flawed in their design because these are um, questions that are um, trying to identify the link between education and prevention of misconduct. But what I found was most interesting, after my uh, responsible conduct of research sessions where I would bring my senior faculty, my friends from the medical school, law school, engineering, and say, please come be a faculty mentor. Please join me in a round table discussion with the students. After those sessions, Ms. Hammond, I have a problem, may I speak with you? I almost always noticed an increase, tenfold, soon after the session, where people would know, oh, there's a person to whom I can turn. She's not so scary administration looking. She seems to be open to a conversation. And as I mentioned earlier, not necessarily falsification, fabrication, or plagiarism, but very often concerns I could send them elsewhere on the campus and let them know there was a support system in place for this very stressful environment. So when there is a big case, obviously you have the lawyers involved. And as we've seen, even with the Huang Wu Suk case, the law, I guess us lawyers are slower than scientists. We are always behind the technological advances, whether it be the Human Genome Project and the law, and suddenly saying, wait, 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 we should regulate this, <laughs> because the scientists are so much faster in their advances than the law, also because of the process in promulgating law. But in essence, we know that there is now a law in Korea about egg donation after the case. So it can sometimes work in tandem, where um, there is a balance between the legal and scientific paradigms. Most effective is probably roundtable discussions, such as that we will have this afternoon, where people can talk among disciplines, between disciplines, be able to learn from each other. The Royal Netherlands Academy, for example, said, well, this is so obvious. There are some very sophisticated systems for managing data, for example, in this discipline. Why can't that discipline learn from them and apply similar approaches? Developing software and drawing upon the lessons learned from other colleagues. So there is NIH guidance around data management. This was uh, updated in 2003 and is still accurate along the lines of what we learned from Leonardo da Vinci, that it must basically be available to others in honest, accurate form, and be detailed enough so that people can replicate, reproduce, as Dr. Prasid mentioned, and be able to build upon the foundations laid by those particular data, even if they're negative. Then people don't waste their time. Uh, Mishner and all looked at 10 simple rules for creating a data management plan. I will refer you to this article as a very good one if you need to have a plan for your university. I'm not sure whether that new wave has hit Thailand yet, but certainly in Hong Kong now, I just learned that all doctoral students, graduate students, must submit a data management plan with the universities and on computer so that the university can also review how the students are managing their data. Mishner came up with 10 simple rules for how to manage the data. This was particularly in the biomedical field, but as the National Institutes of Health acknowledged, it can apply to other fields, and perhaps the government cannot mandate one particular way to manage data. I would like to draw your attention to the ninth, which is assigning roles and responsibilities. 
because of the critical role of teaching and providing example for your students and those working with you, it is critical to understand who is doing what, what the expectations are. Well, if your PI is telling you to run the experiments but doesn't tell you that you also need to be producing it in this particular form according to her instructions, well, there may be some confusion, there may be some conflict that arises, and all of a sudden problems with the data at the very last moment when they need to be submitted. Probably, at a minimum, a plan should be a living document, and not necessarily stagnant, whereby a year later when you are reviewing your data, if you've learned there is a new way to do this and better, continue to keep it alive and enhance it as we do with our human beings. The European Research Council came up with a nice acronym which I always find helpful for remembering things, which is simply that a plan should be findable. In other words, we know how to access it. Leonardo is perhaps not quite following this when he had little bundles everywhere. Eventually they found them and put them together. But he wasn't thinking about making it accessible necessarily. He was just fascinated by the mysteries of the universe and trying to write it down. So accessible means if, for example, you're working with a researcher in a different jurisdiction, a different discipline, that they have a means of reaching it and simply being able to use it. Or if it's not applicable to them, it should be clear that this may not be effective for this particular discipline. And this goes to some of the questions of open data, limited data, restricted access. How, for example, if we're storing human specimens in a biorepository, that may need to be publicized so people are aware. And able to be interoperable across the different disciplines. So that, for example, when we have these fascinating cross border translational projects. We know that we can perhaps learn from each other while not necessarily verifying the veracity of the data. For example, with Juan Musuk, there were collaborators in the US, in Michigan. Jose Sibeli is one example, who was a co-author. Nothing to do with the work Juan Musuk was doing in Korea, but suddenly, as a co-author, he's taking credit, but also blame. And he was subject to an investigation around his role in the project. Making sure that it has enough procedures in place so that it can be reusable. And the European Research Council, like a missioner, noted that there may be costs associated, so sometimes if uh, we are beginning to write a grant application and looking at preliminary data, we may be so focused on the hypothesis and our methodology that we don't think about the fact that we might need to accommodate fees for a biospecimen repository, for example. So there should, if appropriate, perhaps be a budget associated. I had the good fortune of working with several creative individuals at the Office of Research Integrity one of whom is Mr. Lachlan Kwa, who came up with this idea of reaching researchers at younger stages, which of course is very helpful at any stage of our career we need to learn. But we learn probably more by osmosis when we're younger because we're not so stubborn yet thinking that we know everything about what we do. So this infographic was designed based not only on my experience with uh, cases of misconduct, but also with several of our scientists investigators in ORI on the other division with my counterpart, Dr. Susan Garfinkel, where we said, what are some of those risk points? What are the problems in the cases that you see? And these are some of them that are particularly important. This acronym standing for Research Integrity Officer. If you are playing a role of a mentor and a supervisor, these conversations are critical to have. At a recent training session in Hong Kong, we had nearly 200 students and said, 
Has anyone had a conversation with their supervisor about their data management, data management plan, their expectations, and maybe two or three sheepishly raised their hands? But most were afraid to raise this conversation because their supervisors were busy or they didn't think it was appropriate to bring a topic to the table. So also important to remind ourselves as supervisors that maybe they're wondering about these things and I shouldn't let them guess, I should describe it. And if needed, establish a process for managing conflicts when they may arise. What happens if the student is having problems at home and they're not sleeping? We know that will affect their role in the laboratory or the classroom. So how can we support them and help them feel confident to come and communicate when it may not be about data but about a crisis they're having in their personal lives? Dr. John Carfora at the Loyola Marymount University had this concept of engaging researchers and taking senior leaders from the top, as we said with this arc, and encouraging them to promote the belief in integrity in science from the inside, as we learned from Gandhi and others, and not just think about tick the box compliance. So we were fortunate to have a meeting at Loyola Marymount in Los Angeles in April 2016, where we brought together senior leaders like yourselves and researchers, about 80 people from five different countries. We put them, of course, in round table conversations, and they came up with several recommendations for senior leaders, university presidents, vice presidents, don't just come to the lecture and and maybe say a little welcome and then leave, which is at least better than some, but then not support the process at the university where there is an office designated to handle concerns like this. If you don't give them money, you don't give them administrative support, you don't give them funds to travel to meetings so they can learn from their peers in other parts of the world, then maybe it's just for show and not necessarily coming from within as it should be. Also, emphasizing the positive. So in many of our responsible conduct of research uh, courses around the US, they tell stories about bad things that happen and people say, oh, I'll never do that. And yet, when it comes to the night before the manuscript is due and they haven't slept, etc., sometimes that slippery slope can become slippery indeed. We mentioned also, the concept of having research integrity newsletters or providing support for promotion and tenure and service, for example, for those who are serving on panels and supporting the process of integrity at the university. These incentives will be critical in bringing people to the table to have conversations in a positive way rather than turning our head and saying, no, no, we don't discuss that at our university, to happily have conversations about it in positive ways. And to provide tremendous support for whistleblowers. This is a huge problem, even though written in policies, our university protects whistleblowers. It's very difficult to protect people from subtle, discrete forms of retaliation, which may happen in the lab or elsewhere within the community. Perhaps a very fancy, handsome PI will say, don't work with this person, this person's terrible, which may not be true at all. Critical to provide support and help them through the process. And in fact, most of the cases I managed at the University of Hawaii that were uh, severe, the allegation came after the person left the lab. That means we're not doing a good job at protecting whistleblowers and, and encouraging them to come forward. Also, as we mentor, knowing that people are different human beings, they're at different stages of their career development. Here, my niece was perfectly happy to plunge into the waves while my nephew was uh, rather shy and a little bit afraid wanting to go towards shore. And this can happen in spite of uh, all of the support that an office or a mentor can provide. People are different, which is a beautiful thing. 
and that those senior administrators like the vice presidents and the presidents are actually coming and rolling up their sleeves and saying, yes, I'll do this with you. Not just, I'll tell you what to do, I'll do this with you. So that we can perpetuate for next generations this culture of integrity. Again, I applaud Dr. Prasit for being at the crest of the wave. Prior to a giant tsunami or typhoon occurring, he is riding this beautiful wave of integrity before you have a huge case in Thailand. And knowing that you have your community. So there are people around you who are interested in this topic. Just take a look at your person on the left or the right. There are lots of people wanting to do this so we can do it together and engage these conversations. Whether you are observing gliders and inventing uh, new ways of flying through the sky, or perhaps marveling at the splendor of the human brain and all of its capacity, this concept of coming to an agreement and consensus around all of these issues is fundamental, sometimes not in writing, sometimes writing is important. And being aware of these local networks as well as international networks around research integrity. So you have the honor of one of the founding members of the Asia Pacific Network here with you, Dr. Prasit was at our first meeting in San Francisco, and he was one of the first when I was wanting to do this from the University of Hawaii, because I said, we have a lot of cases involving Asia. We don't know their rules. I can do Google Translate to Korean or Thai, but it doesn't work very well. And I could not find a person who was involved in research integrity to contact and say, we have a case involving your university. So I had the occasion of speaking with Dr. David Wright, who was the then director of the Office of Research Integrity, and said, let's do a meeting around Asia Pacific Research Integrity. He embraced the idea, and we nearly had a meeting in Hawaii. We had to cancel for budget reasons. But even for that Hawaii meeting, Dr. Prasi responded within, I think, less than a day, and said, yes, I am willing to join you. I would love to join you. Thank you for this opportunity. Many um, exchanges occurred at our first formal meeting that then had, uh, I think, about 80 people from 13 different countries. And you can see Kasit here at the table. And your Thai colleague, this is Canada. We have from all Korea, all around the region. Danny Chan from Hong Kong, Eric Ma. We have people discussing these topics and having their own ideas they're bringing to the table, not just the US approach. The last meeting we had in February of this year was in Hong Kong. They graciously took the network to a whole new level, and my picture of my um, lily, or I'm sorry, lotus in the garden, my parents' pond, became a fancy logo. So I thought, oh, we're official now. It's a thanks to our Hong Kong colleagues. And the next meeting is happening in Taipei in February. So if you are particularly enthusiastic about this topic, please join us. Go to the website APRI 2018 and learn about it. It is still, uh, there is still time to submit abstracts and also time to speak to the organizers about joining, registering, bringing your colleagues along so you can learn not just from those from the West, but all of your colleagues in the region who are doing fantastically creative things. The World Conference in Amsterdam, as part of our arc of creating an accountable research community, the theme was accountability and transparency. And the next meeting is held in Hong Kong in 2019. So you have plenty of time to get your tickets for Hong Kong. This arc of integrity, I believe, will help us emanate from within and from the bottom up and the top down. You don't really see the end of a rainbow. It goes from the sky to the ground and bounces back and forth. So as we have in Malaysia, a young scientist network, we learned in Japan, one of the things they did was put out a contest 
for students, what's the best idea for research integrity? And the students came up with fantastic ideas and now they have clubs on research integrity, for example. So not only the senior vice presidents, but those who are young, our next generation, need to be engaged. Thank you, Kapunka. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation, Ms. Hamad. Next, may I invite Professor Prasip Pritapurkantin to present a token of appreciation to the distinguished speakers. Uh, do we have a moment for a question or no? Uh, we will have the question again in the afternoon session. Afternoon for, session. Yeah, for, well, for Dr. For Ms. Hamad. Yeah, yeah, one or maybe one or two questions. Or we can present gifts, that's just as nice. <laughs> ah, we have one. So um, I asked again, um, the question is uh, like when we talk about ethics, so there is like something like for myself like a little bit complicated and hard to understand. So my question is like ethics and, and the culture in different countries, is that something uh, like we can bring them together or is that sometimes the problems like to bring ethics to a certain area of the world? Mm. Thank you. <laughs> this is uh, one of those perpetual questions like what does it mean to be human? Why am I here? When I hear your question, I empathize with your concern and also acknowledge your enthusiasm because it's like religion almost. Ethics is, is so complex and there are, um, they in essence emanate from the religious traditions of the world. And I was fortunate to do my uh, master's degree in law and ethics in medicine in, at the University of Glasgow. And there we discussed many different approaches. It's not just the Western sociology philosophical approach to ethics, but also engaging lots of different approaches to ethics. And so I think, again, when we have esteemed scholars who point to different traditions, there may be Gandhi or Confucius or others around the world who have come up with similar principles, they're essentially the same which is why I've never understood religious wars. <laughs> but in essence, in this field, that's part of the problem where we are now a compliance-driven culture and not so much the ethics aspect because it's, if it's so hard to find harmony among the ethical approaches, let's just create a checklist. So in some ways, that's helpful. We need to know I have deposited my specimens in this repository, etc., etc. I have filled out the proper forms. But we must uh, remain cognizant of the ethical principles that underpin these compliance forms. And I think that's the problem. When, when these forms just start becoming so administrative and burdensome on researchers, we lose the fact that it's connected and in fact arises from these ethical principles. So I believe harmony is possible in much the way rainbows and clouds are universal to the world, but it's our challenge. Thank you for your question. Kapunka, we should have gifts. Okay. To present a token of appreciation again. First, Professor Yong Yu Then, Miss So Hamad. <laughs> 